thank you, Greg, for that uh, very nice introduction. I loved it, that it was short, and I love that it was beautiful, so I appreciate it. Um, I also really appreciate the work that CCI is doing. Um, I don't know if there's anyone in this room that they are not providing help and technical assistance to, or have not over the years. I doubt it, um, which shows the tremendous reach um, that they have and the influence in really making our court systems uh, live up to the ideal that they can become. And thank you, the Cook County uh, Justice Leaders, uh, for starting us off and for that warm, warm welcome. I understand that there are an amazing 110 jurisdictions represented here from 32 states, as well as six countries outside the US, which speaks volumes about Greg's vision of community courts and the growth of the community court family uh, throughout the country. I like Greg, um, you're gonna hear a lot of themes from both of us today. Um, I speak about the time in which we live as a real renaissance in criminal justice thinking. We know so much more now than we ever did before about what works in criminal justice because of improved data and action-based research. There are more opportunities now than ever before to achieve true systems reform that results in stronger and safer communities. So I'm going to use my precious time, being the sixth speaker, I'm going to shorten it a little, don't applaud now, um, but I'm going to use my time to reflect with you on four topics. We both had four themes here. First, how far we've come as a criminal or as a community justice a community. Second, what the research shows about the effectiveness of community justice programs. I'm going to shorten that part. Uh, because we have a great pr presentation on that that I hope you'll all attend tomorrow. Third, my own sense about why the growth of uh, community justice programs answers some of the most pressing challenges of our time. And finally, I'm going to quickly talk about the Justice Department's firm, unwavering commitment to support community justice and community courts. In other, way, in other words, what we at BJA are doing to support the important work that you are all doing. So how far have we come? Since 1993, with the opening of the first community court in Midtown that Greg talked about, there's now approximately 50 community and neighborhood courts operating in the US, not counting the number of community justice initiatives like community prosecution and holistic defense programs adopting community justice principles. Internationally, I understand that community courts are operating in Canada, Australia, South Africa, and Singapore, and I'm sure that we're going to learn about some other ones um, during our, our summit over the next three days. My own personal engagement in community courts dates back eight or so years ago, um, when, as the director of the Division of Criminal Justice Services in New York, uh, Julius Lang uh, managed to um, invite me to tour the Red Hook Community Center, which DCJS had helped to support in its early uh, years. And I got to really see firsthand how a community court could really be a catalyst for change for an entire neighborhood, an entire community. So I was so pleased when I arrived at BJA in 2011 to learn that BJA had been supporting CCI in this important work since the beginning, and to see the work of CCI really take off and take on a national and international profile, as we will see vividly uh, during the summit. So what does the research tell us about community courts? This is the short part. When, but, but the research is, is not short. Um, one of the innovations accompanying the development of community courts is the notion of embedding research and evaluation at the very onset. We haven't seen that in many of our criminal justice developments. 
And there is now a strong body and growing body of evidence demonstrating the impact of community courts thanks to your work. Evidence suggests that community courts are making a real difference in so many important areas, in crime reduction, in streamlining the justice process. Evidence suggests that community courts are making a difference in sentencing practice, in helping individuals with their problems, and in reducing reoffending. And as I'm going to talk a lot more about, and you've heard from Greg, in increasing trust in the justice system. It has been said that nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And I think that is especially true when it comes to community justice. So what is behind this growing interest in community justice? And why is its importance, in a sense, magnified today, perhaps even more so than in 1993 when the community courts began? I think the answer lies in what communities are looking to us for. And they're looking to all of us in the criminal justice system who are involved in dispensing justice, to judges, to prosecutors, to police, defenders, probation officers, service providers. Neighborhood residents are looking to have a voice and be heard. They're asking to be treated with respect. And they're looking for solutions to real problems they are experiencing in their lives. Community courts and community justice programs are built around those very concepts. In the words of New York's now retired chief judge, so Judge Lippman, you're very much here in, in, in spirit. Um, I love a quote that's on the, the video that CCI produced about community courts, where Judge Lippman says, Aren't we all tired of seeing the same persons with the same problems circulating through our courts time and time again for low-level offenses without ever having their underlying problems resolved? Well, since the midtime community court was established until today, that is what, to me, community justice is all about. And though they started 25 years ago, community courts and community justice centers are more relevant today than they ever were. As we tackle longstanding problems, as Greg has said, with community trust in our legal system, community courts provide some important lessons to all of us. And I'm going to talk about two of them, a little bit of overlap again. But the first is procedural justice, because community courts have been dispensing procedural justice long before the, the research of Tom Tyler and Tracy Mears um, have really capture, captured for all of us the lesson that procedural justice can motivate persons to actually engage in future law-abiding behaviors. Judges, and many of them are in this audience, embody the principles of, of procedural justice by treating the persons who come before them with respect, allowing them to be heard, helping them understand and navigate the court system, and helping ensure a fair result in their cases. Because of that, community justice is a pathway to building community trust. Another example of why community justice is so critical in these times is fees and fines. And Julius mentioned that, but I'm going to go into it a little, in a little more detail. One of the most important lessons that many of us learned from the civil rights investigation of the Ferguson Police Department is the inequitable burden which a court system built on fees and fines places on community residents who can least afford it. Since that time uh, of the Ferguson Civil Rights uh, Report being released, the White House has held an important convening on the impact of fees and fines in the justice system, and BJA has issued a solicitation to identify pilot sites to begin to unravel the full extent to which the justice system relies on fees and fines and to begin to identify solutions. For those of us and, and many of us in, in this audience who've been working in the justice system for many years, we know how deeply rooted this issue is from selective traffic um, enforcement 
and fines in economically challenged communities like Ferguson, to fees in some parts of the country for community supervision or attendance in a drug court, and the list goes on and on. But one notable exception is community courts. And your focus on holding persons accountable for their actions through alternative sentences, working on community improvement projects, participating in treatment um, and services, or as we will hear from Judge Pratt, writing essays which instill a form of positive thinking for change. Listen to a person who has completed community service on a project that helped beautify the person's neighborhood and compare that to the experience of a community resident who is struggling to make ends meet and who has a costly fine imposed that impacts that person's family could result in a violation of community supervision, loss of a driver's license, or even loss of liberty. And the importance of community courts as a viable alternative to the fees and fines paradigm is clear. So as you can see um, from a large turnout of the BJA team, uh, we at BJA uh, are firmly committed to community justice and to supporting the work uh, that everyone in this room is engaged in. And um, let me end by really focusing a bit on the work that we are doing to support the efforts of CCI through the National Problem Solving Justice Initiative, building up to my great announcement at the end of my remarks. <laughs> so, um, a couple things that I really want um, to, to mention. First of all, um, I was not facetious when I asked if anyone out here has not received TTA um, from CCI. If you have not, sign up today, <laughs> um, because CCI has been doing this in so, for so many years and has impacted um, the development of community justice all across the country. And they know what they're doing. Among the jurisdictions who've received their technical assistance this year are Olympia, Washington, Dane County, Wisconsin, and Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama. And folks from all those sites, I understand, are here. So I hope you will seek them out and talk to them about their innovative programs. But as part of, uh, and I think an important part of, of the work that they do, is that they've hosted literally thousands of practitioners on structured peer-to-peer -peer visits uh, to the community courts in New York City, which to me is one of the most valuable uh, lessons you can learn, um, to actually focus on the core principles of problem-solving justices and meet with your peers who are doing great things um, in the community courts. Additionally, I know many of you participate in the Court Builders Listserv. If you don't, please sign up. It currently has 300 members and is such a valuable tool uh, for really creating this robust community um, of, of a justice community uh, for over a decade. Um, another important aspect of the work coming out of this joint initiative is really practical tools that you can use to implement community justice principles um, in your work. So you're going to hear a lot, uh, and there's a lot of discussion here at the summit um, about the risk-need uh, assessment tool developed by CCI um, for use with misdemeanor offenses and in community courts. A number of you are, are, are implementing them and using the tools in your work, so thank you for that. Um, but it, also another um, important tool to really assist courts in measuring procedural justice and procedural fairness in their courts. So there are a few people I want to call out in the audience who are really leading a lot of these efforts. First are our mentor courts, Hartford Community Court, Orange County Community Court, San Francisco Community Justice Center, and South Dallas Community Court. You don't just have to go to New York anymore to see viable really effective um, community courts throughout the country. And then, um, as a result of really implementing the procedural justice measurement tool, um, we have uh, jointly selected other um, courts who have volunteered for this project um, to actually implement the tool in their work. 
assess their courts um, using the tool, and I want to recognize those courts as well. Salem, Massachusetts, Allegheny County, PA. Moulton, I always get this wrong. Moulton, uh, Moulton, okay, whatever. Oh, Oregon, you, you can get after me uh, at the uh, event tonight. Um, and the Utah State Court System, who have committed um, to work on that project. So I'm going to just ask everybody involved in those courts, our mentor courts, our procedural justice courts, to stand for a big round of applause to all of you. You are doing fabulous work. So um, on a more sobering note, um, we all well know that the job of implementing a community justice program is not easy. I don't think you can take that from any of the remarks that Greg made or that I'm making. Collaboration, which is the secret sauce for the success of any uh, criminal justice effort, is hard work, even for uh, those of us who love and embrace it. Bad outcomes in individual cases can set us back without strong support from stakeholders and community. Changes in leadership, loss of funding, uh, poverty, politics, change in court rules and personnel can disrupt and slow down even the best uh, programs. But that's all the more reason that building this community trust, brain trust in this room and, and with your many partners um, at home is so vitally important. That's what this summit is all about, and I know you'll take great advantage of everything it has to offer and make lots of new friends. And now, for the moment you've all been waiting for, the end of my remarks, um, but even better. Um, so this year, uh, we together with CCI and, and BJA uh, launched the first ever community court grant program where we competitively selected 10 jurisdictions to receive funding, not something that's always been available in this area, and technical assistance uh, to promote alternatives to incarceration through community courts. Amazingly, um, we had over 70 applications from jurisdictions all across the country. And after a rigorous review process, um, an outside review process that involved lots of stakeholders, uh, 10 applicants were selected for funding, and it's my great honor, I, I share this um, with CCI, um, to share the names of the award winners. And if you are here, and I know um, some of them are coming on Friday or before Friday, so you might, might not be here yet, but if you are here, no screaming, no jumping up, no, like, just, you, just stand, and we will all applaud you. The Cleveland Municipal Court, The Philadelphia Mental Health Corporation. The City of Olympia, Washington. The Dallas County Public Defender's Office. They'll be here. City of Spokane Municipal Court. Thank you, working in their library, which is fabulous. The Las Vegas Township Justice Court. The city of Eugene, Oregon. Wow, everybody. The city and county of Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Office, where I'm making a site visit. Just kidding. Um, the city of Jersey City. And we don't usually fly everyone into the location where we're giving out uh, are recognizing someone for getting a grant, but in this case, we've flown you here to announce a grant to the Circuit Court of Cook County. <laughs> so congratulations to all the awardees, and thank you for letting me speak to you and be part of opening up this great summit. Thank you. Thank you.